Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Ethics and AI Colloquium for 2021. My name is John Tassoulis, and I'm the director of Oxford's Institute for Ethics and AI. A major objective of the Institute is to bring the clarity and argumentative rigor of philosophy to many of the ethical challenges thrown up by AI. That's how philosophy can advance ethical reflection on AI. But of course, it's not a straightforward one-way process. AI ethics can also enrich philosophy. One way it can do so is by getting, uh, by motivating philosophers to engage with issues of urgent human concern that they've tended to neglect. This is why I'm especially excited about the discussion we're going to have today, because work, a matter of great material and spiritual concern to most of us, has been a topic that has generally eluded the radar of contemporary philosophical discussion. AI raises ethical questions about work, about its value, just distribution, its political significance, in an especially acute way. This is because, at least on one telling, it seriously raises the prospect of a jobless or virtually jobless future, as automation goes beyond taking over mechanical tasks and makes massive inroads into jobs that are performed by university trained professionals. Should we welcome this as a beckoning utopia in which humans are liberated to engage in art, play, religion, politics, and family life? Or does it threaten a dystopia in which economic and social inequalities are magnified and class conflict massively aggravated? or where the vast majority of people perhaps just sink into apathetic and meaningless lives. To help us navigate these issues, I'm delighted to welcome our main speaker, David Goodhart. David is the head of the think tank policy exchanges, demography, immigration and integration unit, the founder of Prospect Magazine and a member of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. His most recent book is Head, Hand, Heart, The Struggle for Dignity and Status in the 21st Century. In this book, he argues that the United Kingdom and the US have adopted a narrow form of meritocracy that accords excessive esteem to those employed in cognitive analytical work, head, as opposed to those working in technical, hand, and caring or social, heart domains. He predicts, however, that automation driven by AI will be one of the factors that will lead to a rebalancing of esteem as demand for middle-level professionals declines while technical and caring occupations experience a resurgence. We also have two excellent commentators to discuss um, David's ideas. First, Rachel Fraser, who is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Oxford and a fellow of Exeter College. Rachel, in my view, is one of the most interesting and wide-ranging philosophers around, and she may well be the best philosophical uh, exponent of Twitter. I very much urge you to look at her Twitter feed. Our second commentator is Dr. Daniel Suskind, who is a fellow of economics at Balliol College at Oxford and a visiting professor at King's College London. His most recent book is the widely praised a world without work, so very opposite for tonight's discussion. There will, of course, be a Q&A at the end, so please use the chat section on YouTube for your questions. But right now, I'm delighted to turn over to David for his remarks. David. John, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I mean, I, I, I want to um, talk tonight about the mainly about the themes in my book that you mentioned, Head, Hand, Heart. Um, uh, the, I always forget the subtitle, it's The Struggle for Dignity and Status in the 21st Century. Um, so I will, I mean, I'll sort of touch at the end perhaps on the issues of uh, worklessness, um, or the disappearance of work, but um, I mean, my main concern, as the title suggests, is about the way that we currently allocate reward and esteem to different kinds of, uh, of work. Um, 
and um, I mean the the kind of thesis of the book is sort of there in the title really I mean the, um, my my argument which is it so it's a it's kind of part two of of two books this book my the book I wrote three years ago called The Road to Somewhere was about the value divides um, that particularly the educationally based value divides that have emerged to dominate politics in some ways in the last few decades um, and I think have been partly partly responsible for the mass political alienation expressed in the Brexit vote that you know the vote the votes, one might say, for Trump, both 2016 and 2020, 73 million, I think it was. Um, and, um, and the head, hand, heart tries to bury down a bit deeper into, um, uh, in, into, into understanding the, the value divides and, and why so many people seem to feel uh, out of sorts with society that otherwise seem, you know, you, you know compared to... Um, past societies and indeed compared to most ex existing other societies in the world, uh, you know, extremely rich and free. Um, um, and I mean, my, my explanation is, is that, that we have allocated too much reward and prestige to just one cluster of human aptitudes, those associated with cognitive, analytical, kind of exam passing ability, the manipulation uh, of information. Um, and that has inevitably um, drawn away status and um, and reward from from other clusters that that I very broadly describe as hand and heart hand meaning the manual technical craft um, uh, heart being you know everything from sort of caring to to, to to any job that requires a high degree of emotional intelligence um, and of course this is not new you might say this goes right back to the beginnings of human civilization where uh, you know where the mind, where thought was considered sort of pure and elevated, and 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 embodied work was seen as as, as kind of demeaning and 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 and, and uh, open to moral corruption and and so on. And uh, you know Plato, Christianity. I mean, you know, so much of our culture is is based in a way on on uh, the elevation of the cognitive. But it didn't really matter very much because so few people actually did cognitive work um, till surprisingly recently. Um, and I think um, the, the issues that I talk about in the book have only really become real in the last sort of 40 or 50 years in the time when we have had a kind of mass cognitive class, if you like, um, and uh, produced by a mass higher education system. And in that time we've had we, you know, we've seen how uh, you know smart people in the in the kind of narrow sense of the, of, of exam passing smart smartness um uh were once pretty randomly distributed um around society and that in many ways is no longer the case so those people with that at least that form of human aptitude uh, have been sort of sucked up um into the kind of professional managerial cognitive class, um, uh, which now um, you know, one third plus of our uh, of the adult population probably belongs to, um, and I mean you know th this in many ways is is, a, is, a, is an old and obvious story. With you know the returns to qualification is one of the main. Um, observation, one of the main central observations of modern labour market theory um, and um, and status usually follows the money, not always, you know, one can think of all sorts of categories of work where people don't aren't necessarily highly rewarded but have high status, you know, vicars for example, or, um, you know, artists of various kinds. Um, but um, the um, I think this isn't just a question of um, the labour market. It's not just a question of the rewards and status attached to jobs. Uh, um, I think it's also the idea of what it is to to lead a successful life has become much narrower, um, and that I think has, has also borne down on on those people who either can't or don't want to climb that ladder and by the way it's become a kind of single ladder I think you know you go back 
you know, not that, you know, go back 30 or 40 years, and there were lots of little ladders up into, into a successful achieved life. And I think uh, that, um, that has become one big ladder up into the institutions of higher education, effectively. This is all predicted rather um, presently by Daniel Bell in The Coming of Post-Industrial Society, written in 1972, when, when all this, well, it was already kind of underway because America um, ventured first into mass higher education. Um, but he sort of predicted, I think, what has happened in most rich countries. Um, now, I mean, just a, a few caveats. Obviously, head, hand and heart is an artificial distinction. Um, I mean, I do say this in the book, one or two um, of the reviews have criticised me for um, taking, the, taking the distinction too literally. Obviously, everything that any human being does at any moment of the day involves a combination you know, of the cognitive, the embodied, the emotional. Um, um, but I still think it's a, you know, it's a useful abstraction when one's thinking about uh, labour markets and the and as it were the kind of dominant set of dominant cluster of aptitudes that that um, uh, that are involved in a particular job. Um, it's also uh, I shouldn't perhaps need to say this, but it's, you know this is not an argument against high intelligence. High intelligence is uh, you know probably more necessary than ever before uh, for the human species. You know we've just seen a wonderful uh, example of it in in action with you know, highly intelligent, highly skilled, highly academically skilled scientists collaborating together across national boundaries to come up with, um, with vaccines for, to, to combat the, um, the COVID virus. Um, and um, you know, we, need, we need highly skilled, uh, analytically skilled people to come up with ways of, um, you know, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and so on and so forth so um but i think it's also important to remember that the creators of new knowledge uh useful new knowledge are always well certainly at the moment and and i i think one can confidently say will always be a very very small minority even of the cognitively trained um and i think you know what's happened is that the sort of that that this expanded sort of cognitive bureaucracy, which now perhaps encompasses you know, you know, between a third and a half of the adult population in rich countries, um, is sort of piggybacking on the prestige of knowledge creators. You know, most of us are not knowledge, new knowledge creators um, and never will be. Um, um, I mean, another caveat is that I think many of the problems that I talk about, many of the issues I talk about are worse, are, are more developed in the US and the UK in the so-called Anglo-Saxon countries, somewhat less so in the Germanic countries, in Scandinavia, where they've retained a degree of prestige for the kind of manual technical, um, you know, the, the kind of handwerk, uh, what the Germans called handwerk occupation, so skilled trades and so on, um, or rather that, uh, the, the, you know, all, all these abilities are seen as somehow on the same plane. Um, it's interesting. I mean, you know, quite a few of the members of Angela Merkel's cabinet uh, uh, are people who did conventional apprenticeships. Jens Spahn, the health minister, did a Kaufmann apprenticeship, a sort of um, a finance marketing uh, apprenticeship. Um, and um, but he then went on to do a university degree. I think he's got a PhD as well. He did a, did a further degree. Um, and I think that's, that, that, that is quite common in Germany. Um, um, and I think the, the final caveat is that what, what I'm talking about, I think has now become dysfunctional, but at one point it was functional. You know, if you go back to, you know, the seventies or the eighties, um, that, I mean, but both for kind of social justice reasons and for purely economic reasons, there was very good grounds for wanting to kind of expand the professional managerial, mainly cognitive based occupations. Um, you know, when, when I left university, there were probably about 10% of the population, probably 10% of school leavers went to university. Now it's um, somewhere between 40 and 50%. And, uh, you know, in one sense, that can only be a good thing. It's a democratization of the elite, you might say. Um, um, and indeed, there was also there was also the demand. There was also uh, you know this was the time of the knowledge economy emerging. 
It was the time of uh, also a huge expansion of the welfare state from the, the, from the 60s um, onwards. And we forget sometimes, I think, just how many um, sort of higher professional jobs produced by the welfare state. When you think of you know, doctors, all, all the professions associated with medicine, teachers, uh, you know, university lecturers. Um, so, um, well, my point is that <laughs> this is no longer functional. Um, that for all sorts of reasons, um, the um, this sort of the, this the, this distribution of reward and prestige, the encouragement of you know of as many young people as possible to go through this this funnel into uh, academic study and um, you know do well at school, go to a good university, have a successful professional um, cognitive job. Uh, that this is now, I mean, obviously, logically, not everybody could ever do that. <laughs> there was always a limit on the number of people who could go through that funnel and into that world of safety and success. Um, I mean, you know, some people just don't have the cognitive of ability to, to, to get there. Um, uh, you know, many people don't have the opportunity to to get there, but also there's the kind of more, rather more basic fact that uh, you know not not everybody can be a scientist or a statistician. You know we we need people to um, to remove our rubbish and clean our offices and um, you know do both very basic jobs and lots of kind of middle skill jobs. Um, you know maintain the kit that that um, has proliferated in our lives and um, you know maintain our power stations as well as our laptops um and uh, and of course care for our uh, uh, our elderly people in in increasingly aging societies so um um what was functional i think has now become dysfunctional so that when you know when i started writing this book it seemed to struck me as being quite an idealistic thesis in a way the idea of shifting status across these clusters of aptitudes, the more I looked into it, and it's a, this is a journalistic book, I'm not claiming this is a, a great work of scholarship, so I was just reading secondary sources, but the more I read, the more it seemed to me that um, that what was, what a, had, that started off as a kind of rather idealistic, even new agey notion of, of kind of distrib you know, distributing status, um, was kind of inevitable, I mean, actually, because it turns out the knowledge economy doesn't actually need that many knowledge workers. Um, and this is even before, I mean, I, I you know, I bowed to uh, Daniel and Rachel on this, but uh, you know, I don't know a huge amount about, uh, about AI, um, except that it seems obvious that um, from what I have read, that it is coming for the kind of middle and lower levels of the cognitive class. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the kind of the, you know, the lawyers and accountants and, and, and even parts of medicine, uh, certainly administration, um, where those those kind of middle ranking jobs can be re replaced with algorithms of various kinds. Um, but even before that happens on, on, a, on a wide scale, uh, we can already see the signs of the fact that the knowledge economy doesn't need that many knowledge workers. I mean, Daniel's written a lot about the um, the kind of the end of the professions, but just the rather more basic facts that are, that are, that are there in front of our eyes, the, the collapse of the graduate income premium. Now, that was inevitable, I guess, you know, when, you know, when you move from only 10% of school leavers going to university to 40 or 50%, the graduate income premium is down, is bound to, 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 to decline, but it's, but it's collapsed for, I mean, it, it, it barely exists for quite a large proportion, particularly of young males um, at non-elite universities. Uh, it, it, it's, it's held up to some extent at elite universities. We also have 30%, roughly 30% of recent graduates, I say recent, you know, people who've graduated in the last five to 10 years who are not in graduate employment. And that's even allowing for a pretty elastic definition of what graduate employment is. Um, and if you look at the, if you just look at the kind of class, uh, I, I, is it the ONS one? I mean, there are all these different occupational class schemas. I think it's the ONS one. I think it's a seven class schema, occupational class schema. And the top two classes are the professional and managerial class, um, higher and lower effectively. And um, 
the proportion of um, adults uh, in the top two classes, higher and lower professional and managerial, in the year 2000 was 35%, a bit more than one third, um, perhaps a surprisingly high number. Um, and that number has basically been static for the last 20 years. It's, it's, in 2020, the number was 37%, so it's gone up very slightly. So there's been a very little more room at the top. Um, um, and, um, but I mean, it's, so it's essentially not moving at all. And um, I mean, I, I think all of this together amongst other things has created a, a sort of crisis of disappointed expectations because um, our higher education system and indeed our politics is on kind of automatic pilot. You know, everybody is still told, you know, you know your teachers, your parents, everybody is still telling you there is one path to safety and success and that is through doing well at school and going to a good university and into a, a into a cognitive professional job um, and it's just not it's not going to happen <laughs> for um, I mean you know, we still need a certain number of people to do that but it is not it's not so much of our politics is based on the assumption that this is going to be an ever expanding group of people meanwhile we have these um, huge uh, shortages of the you know the so-called missing middle of um, you know level four five technical skills uh, you know the, the kind of maintenance classes the people that, that maintain all the kit that we use uh, the you know businesses are constantly complaining about the lack of that kind of um, technical skilled labor and we have um, a recruitment crisis in in the in the public care economy uh, not just nurses I mean the, the NHS you know had a shortfall of 50,000 prior to the pandemic Actually, one of one of the one of the good things that come out of the pandemic is that the kind of nurse as hero uh, means that actually more more people are now applying for nursing courses um, than has been the case in recent years. Um, but we have an even bigger recruitment crisis in in adult social care. Uh, you know, everybody knows you know how how poorly we've invested in that, and, and not just the UK. I mean, this seems to be quite a quite a, a, a universal story in rich countries. Uh, we we have not only not invested in it, we have very poor levels of pay, no proper career structure. Um, very, it's a very fragmented uh, industry, and particularly in this country, um, the, the, the care industry. Um, so we have uh, uh, so you know we we have this. Still, everybody is being told to you know to the university is the answer to everything. Meanwhile. Um, under our feet, the economy has shifted, um, and the rewards to um, a, a, at least all but the kind of highest level of cognitive skill and achievement are, uh, I think, set to, uh, or indeed are already declining. And I think, you know, we we are going to have to pay um, care workers a very great deal more than they're being paid at the moment. I mean, otherwise the system will collapse, and nobody wants that to happen. Um, so um, I think the um, the pandemic has has kind of intervened in this argument in in I think in broadly a positive way. I mean, not only um, what I was just saying about um, the boost to nurse recruitment, um, but we've also got you know the way in which um, the kind of key, you know the vast majority of so-called key workers are not graduates, um, and we came to see in a way that perhaps we'd only recognized kind of abstractly we came to, to see far more concretely our dependence on people that you know, deliver drugs to chemists or uh, fill shelves in supermarkets now these jobs are never going to be um, highly paid although and indeed we, we already have a reasonably high minimum wage in this country um, and i think it isn't just about income as i said i think it is also partly about a sense of being recognized as as doing something useful um, and I think because the sort of cognitive jobs have sort of grabbed a disproportionate share of the idea of usefulness you know purpose purposeful work um, and and I think that that is one of the things that has driven um, I mean there's the reward aspect to it too but I think you know the the declining status of non-graduate employment in recent decades I think is 
leads to a lot of people feeling that that their contribution is not valued uh, as, as much as it would have been um, a few decades ago um, before we had created this great sort of bloated cognitive class which also completely dominates politics too and the, the assumptions of the cognitive class within which tend to be biased towards openness and autonomy and the kind of you know in the language of my previous book the kind of anywhere the anywhere um, priorities and virtues tend to be those of the cognitive class. Um, so, um, I mean, I think you know, what one of the, I mean, the, you know, this this argument has implications for 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 not only for the economy but for but for edu for education too. Um, I think the. Um, I mean, I'm very much in favour of the kind of the kind of Michael Gove reforms of whenever it was sort of 10 or 15 years ago, trying to raise the basic standards, um, focusing on rigor, you know, paying less attention to the, to the kind of child-centered um, um, sort of skills-based uh, progressive educational philosophy and really trying to raise the floor for, for, uh, for all our children. Um, but the way that, that, that schools have become relentlessly focused, you know, the status of schools is now relentlessly focused on um, you know, the number of pupils they, they send to elite universities. Um, you know, the practical things have been stripped out of the curriculum. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's also, I think one of the mistakes of the Govian reforms was to kind of downplay the sort of the, the soft subjects. And I think I think their critique of a lot of the so you know the meaning kind of you know art and music and dance and drama, um, th these things were often taught I think very poorly. And actually, it's really interesting if you look at the some of the most hard-headed uh, traditionalist schools um, uh, that that have kind of that have that have kind of embraced the sort of Govian reforms uh, uh, actually teach these things. Um, really, really well. Uh, you know, you, you know, you can teach um, art and music. Um, you know, just in you know, in as hard-headed a way that you te teach maths or science. Um, no, not everybody has the skills to be uh, to be able to to draw well or or, or play a musical instrument. But um, uh, you know, if these things are taught well, then um, and you know, we are going to have more more time on our hands in the robotic future. So I think you know, teaching teaching creative subjects, life skills, mindfulness, all these things. And they, you know, they shouldn't be regarded as, as sort of soft, uh, soft extras. Um, I mean, the, um, I mean, just uh, finally, I mean, I've, I've, I've probably gone on long enough. Um, the, I mean, obviously the whole, the whole kind of meritocracy argument runs sort of in some ways parallel to this. Um, I mean, we, we, we could perhaps talk about that um later the um i mean my, my i mean there's been a lot of um anti-meritocracy writing recently particularly from america michael sandel's book um daniel markovitz and so on and i think well, it's sort of easy enough to see why that is the case because meritocracy has become a, a, a sort of you know, almost banal um motherhood and apple pie policy in most liberal democracies uh, but at a time, particularly in the US, when we've seen grotesque increases in inequality, so it's been it's seen as a kind of legitimization of you know, you know a, a, you know a few people from poorer backgrounds climbing that ladder. Um, and Michael Sandel points out, well, I mean, the meritocracy critique is sort of it gets it it gets it sort of both ways. I mean, the, the, there's both an argument that it's not an ideal in itself because you know, this is back to Michael Young. Why would you want to create a society in which the most able succeed and everyone else feels like a failure? Um, but then the other sort of almost contradictory argument is, but we're not meritocratic enough. <laughs> um, you know, I think Sandel points out that um, the Ivy League universities, is it 1%, 50% uh, of students at the Ivy League universities come from uh, the top 1% of the income spectrum no, hang on. What is it? Uh, yeah, more, no, more more kids at the Ivy League universities come from the top one percent than the whole of the bottom fifty percent of the income spectrum in the U.S. <clears throat> and I mean, uh, the figures for Russell Group universities here are not quite so bad, but not that far off. Um, so there's, I mean, there are all sorts of 
um, uh, I mean, against that, I mean, one, one of the things that I think the merit, merit, meritocracy critics and uh, kind of, you know, it remains kind of in the seminar room because, you know, at the same time, um, if you, you know, even Michael Young acknowledged that we need meritocratic selection for jobs. You know, nobody wants to be operated on by someone who's failed their surgery exams. Um, you know, you, you don't want your, you know, the head of your nuclear research program to be chosen by lottery. You know, you want your best nuclear physicists. Um, so you know the person in the street might well might reasonably say well you know so you're against a meritocratic society but you're in favor of meritocratic selection for jobs sort of where's the difference well i think actually there is a difference <laughs> um um and i mean i sometimes make the comparison between uh, was it Leon, Lionel jospin who talked about being in favor of a market economy but not a market society so one can be, one can believe in meritocracy as a kind of as a um, as a kind of technique, a sort of selection technique for for jobs, without um, without embracing the idea, or, or, or the seeing that the idea of meritocracy, which is in, in, inherently elitist, needs to be um, you know, needs to be accompanied by other ideals. You know the the you know the essential equality of all human beings. Um, 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 but so my emphasis is much more on the kind of cognitive prefix to, to meritocracy that, that um, it's, the, it's the fact that it's one form of, of human aptitude has been um, the driver of, of the meritocratic ideal. And that actually, instead of, uh, you know, instead of chucking out the idea of meritocracy, we, we should in, in try to spread it. And that, that raises really interesting questions, I think, about uh, about how how you um, that you know we, we have a what I call sort of cognitive creep in the way that we measure things even in non-cognitive functions. So you ask an economist why is it that people in care homes are so poorly paid, and they'll say because anybody can do the job. What they mean by that is that that you don't need proper cognitive qualification, or you know you need the most basic cognitive qualification to get a job in a care home. But that's not the point, really, is it? And we all know that. You know, in care homes and indeed in hospitals, you know, there are there are good carers, there are average carers, and there are crap carers, like in any other walk of life. Um, so that it may be that actually we need more meritocratic distinction in some ways in the care economy. Um, I mean, it's easier to it's easier to do it and to measure it, and this is one of the reasons why cognitive things have swept all before them because it seems fair and it seems easy to measure. You know, we all we all read the same biology textbook. And we all do the biology exam and, we, and a hierarchy emerges from it. Some people are, are better at the biology exam than other people. Um, and uh, but, but whereas with care, it's very much harder to do that. You know, how do you know a, a nurse spends eight or 10 hours on a shift in a in a uh, on a geriatric ward and they've, you know, a good nurse has made the lives of you know, 25 elderly people a little bit less miserable. How do you measure? How do you capture that and measure that and, and, and then reward it? And you know, and caring professions tend to be very um, sort of you know, obviously caring and social democratic in their ethos. So actually, you know, imposing more meritocratic distinction may not be at all popular with people who work in in those jobs. Um, anyway, um, that's a that's a bit of a um, a sideline. But um, so yeah, well, I haven't really talked about. The end of work, <laughs> um, but I have talked about the, the the distribution of status at work and how I think we do. You know, we are heading. Um, I hope in a in a somewhat different direction. Obviously, the cognitive um, is still necessary and 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 deserves its rewards. Um, but I think we are we are going to move towards a society where we where we have to increase the the, the value and status of um, of these these other other forms of uh, of human skill and endeavour. Sorry, I went on a bit too long. That is great. Thank you so much, David. That is a very rich set of considerations you've put before us. So now I'm going to invite my philosophy colleague, um, Dr. Rachel Fraser, to give the first set of uh, comments. Rachel. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. 
I'm going to try and pick up on three interrelated themes in the talk as I see them. The first thing I want to talk about is to raise some questions about the broad political paradigm in which you're working, in particular with respect to what Nancy Fraser has called the redistributive as opposed to the recognitional paradigm within political struggle and theories of political struggle. The second thing I want to discuss is whether we need more fine-grained distinctions between things like an internal subjective sense of purpose and notions of status, which seem to me to be being treated somewhat interchangeably in your talk, and that strikes me as a mistake. And then the third thing I wanted to pick up on was what struck me as an elision of unwaged work in your talk. So there was a tendency to treat work and jobs interchangeably, which of course to anyone with a background in feminist theory is going to seem an extremely striking omission, particularly as I think one of the richest political and philosophical traditions for thinking about work in the 20th century was the wages for housework movement, which precisely concerned questions of status around caring labor. So I'll start with my first thought, which is about these competing paradigms for theorizing political struggle and injustice. So the distinction between redistributive and recognitional politics is one I find very helpful for thinking about a wide range of political conflicts and it's articulated most cleanly by Nancy Fraser so I'll just uh, read some Nancy Fraser now. In today's world she says claims for social justice seem increasingly to divide into two types. First are redistributive claims which seek a more just distribution of resources and wealth. Examples include claims for redistribution from the North to the South, from the rich to the poor, and not so long ago, from the owners to the workers. Today, however, she goes on, we increasingly encounter a second type of social justice claim in the politics of recognition. Here, the goal in its most plausible form is a difference-friendly world where assimilation to majority or dominant cultural norms is no longer the price of equal respect. And we might add, Similarly, uh, one desire of recognitional politics is for kind of flatter status hierarchies, right? So you don't want a society in which some people are very, very highly esteemed and other people have very little social esteem. That's a distinctive form of injustice, which many people think can't be assimilated to more familiar forms of redistributive injustice, i.e. some people having lots more money than other people. So one thing that was really striking to me about your talk was that with a few exceptions, the sort of political vernacular in which your theses were being articulated were overwhelmingly the vernacular of recognition rather than redistribution. And that struck me as particularly fascinating given that a very natural way to think about work and why work over the last five or so years has become a particularly rich site of political contestation is precisely the way in which work is a site at which redistributive and recognitional struggles are sort of collapsed together or intersect. Because of course, almost any society is going to need some kind of social institution to play certain functions. One function is we need to have some sort of mode of allocating wealth. Another thing we need to do is we need to have a mode of allocating status. So one of these is primarily a redistributive phenomenon, the other recognitional. What's interesting about work is that by and large, contemporary life, sort of these two functions are bundled together in a single social institution, that of work. But I was slightly worried that the way you were presenting the political struggles around work sort of over-centered the recognitional component and was not sufficiently sensitive to the redistributive component. And I think this is particularly important in the context of attempting to analyze things like Trump's ascendancy, right? The more we sort of theorize these uh, as a result of kind of psychic wounds inflicted on people because of a lack of prestige, I think the more we occlude uh, various significant forms of inequality. Uh, like material inequality. Anyway, so that was one sort of thing, feature of your talk I thought it was worth picking up on, was the kind of dominance of the recognitional political vernacular. 
The second thing I wanted to pick up on was just to say, I think one of the things that's actually very interesting about the distinction between sort of the knowledge economy and other forms of labor is actually, I mean, I think the anthropologist David Graeber made this point most forcefully, was that actually one of the things that confronts many people on a job market in like contemporary, the contemporary world, is actually there's this kind of very curious unlatching of status from purpose. So um, what you'll find is a lot of people in sort of managerial jobs who are sort of crushingly depressed because their jobs, not, not because they lack social status, right? Their jobs are actually relatively prestigious, but their subjective sense of what they're doing is like, I do something completely worthless and pointless and meaningless, something that shouldn't exist. Whereas many people who work in very low prestige jobs are not afflicted by that particular ill, right? They have a very clear sense of what the purpose of their job is. If you're a cleaner, you know, you are in an extremely low prestige profession, but it's pretty obvious what social function you're fulfilling. And it's pretty obvious that it's a valuable social function. So I don't think this is hostile to your overall point. Rather, I think there is an additional lesson about quite how dysfunctional contemporary labor markets are precisely because prestige and, you know, prestige and purpose are sort of so radically decoupled from each other and it seems like one thing you should want from a kind of functional political economic system is some kind of unification of those two things you'd want them at least to roughly map on to each other and the third thing I wanted to pick up on in your presentation was the fact that you tended to treat jobs and labor interchangeably and of course if you are for example a housewife you don't have a job but you do spend quite a lot of your time doing work and work with a peculiarly you know a very distinctive kind of internal phenomenology so there are some one of my favorite descriptions of the, the peculiar phenomenology of housework comes from Doris Lessing in The Golden Notebook. So her narrator, Anna Wolf, speaks. She says, it must be about six o'clock. My knees are tense. I realize that the housewife's disease has taken hold of me. The tension in me so that peace has already gone away from me is because the current has been switched on. I must dress Janet, get her breakfast, send her off to school, get Michael's breakfast, don't forget I'm out of tea, etc., etc. With this useless but apparently unavoidable tension, resentment is also switched on. I try to relax myself to switch off the current, but my limbs have started to ache and I must turn over. There is another movement from beyond the wall. Janet is waking. And a very similar mood is captured by uh, the Peckham Ryle Women's Liberation Group. They say, uh, the appropriate symbol for housework and for housework alone is not the interminable conveyor belt, but a, comp a compulsive circle, like a pet mouse in its cage, spinning round on its exercise wheel, unable to get off like a fever dream, it goes on and on. So both of these texts are drawing attention to uh, a particular phenomenology associated with unwaged domestic labor, where one of the features both these texts are drawing our attention to is the fact that there's no way to switch off right? It's endless. It's interminable. You're never finished. And of course, this is interesting because uh, much waged labor over the last 50 years has acquired more and more of this character. But really the point I want to make is that if we're interested in a politics of recognition, as I think we should be, not everything can be captured using the, the redistributive paradigm. It's absolutely crucial that we attend to the role of unpaid, unwaged domestic labor, because unwaged laborers historically I think have been those who are most thoroughly excluded from the hierarchies and circulation of social prestige and the way that is affected is that their work is not even recognized as work in the first place it's rather presented as the kind of natural outcome of love and one thing that struck me as interesting was that the coding of caring labor under the rubric of heart risks being complicit in precisely the kind of erasure of caring labor's status as 
labor that movements like wages for housework have been so keen to fight against. So I thought that there was an interesting potential problem here, just in the framing of caring labor as deeply related to the activity of the heart, because many people who engage in forms of caring labor will want to contest that characterization because they think it occludes the state of what they do as labor. Thank you. Excellent, Rachel. Thank you so much. And now we'll move on to Daniel Suskin. Daniel. Great. Thank you uh, very much. It's a real pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, what, what I want to do in the next few minutes uh, is share a few thoughts on technology and on automation, uh, which is one of my uh, particular interests and how it might interact with uh, the ideas that we've heard uh, so far this evening. Now, it seems like every day we hear stories of systems and machines that are taking on tasks and activities until recently uh, we thought only human beings alone could ever do. Making medical diagnoses and driving cars, drafting legal contracts and composing music, designing buildings and, and writing news reports. You know, what does all of this technological progress mean for the overwhelming majority of us for whom our job is our main, if not our only source of income. You know, I think the threat of automation is one of the biggest challenges of our time. And it seems to me uh, that this challenge is very closely intertwined uh, with many of the themes that we've just heard uh, over the last uh, 40 minutes or so. So I, I actually, I just want to take for granted one of David's central ideas, the desirability of a of a better balance between head, hand, and heart. Uh, and instead, I want to look at another interesting idea which has been uh, discussed this evening. Uh, and to put it in David's words, that there are trends and forces underway that mean in the 21st century, this rebalancing uh, between those three different categories of work is not only desirable, but it's also more likely uh, that again, quoting David, that head will soon face a more even contest uh, with hand and heart. And, and looking at that thought with the threat of automation in particular in mind, it seems to me that technological change and the advances that are taking place uh, gives us two reasons for thinking that that sort of rebalancing is more likely. Uh, two reasons for, for sharing in, in, in that sort of optimism, but I think also one reason for being more a little more pessimistic. Uh, and this relates in particular uh, to how the threat of automation uh, has evolved over the last 12 months uh, during the pandemic in particular. So I think the first reason to be optimistic that this rebalancing is going to take place is that head work is, it seems to me, far less protected from automation uh, than it was in the past. Now, for some time, it was thought that white collar work, you know, prototypical head work could not readily be automated. Why? Well, the conventional wisdom was that if you wanted to build a machine to automate a task, you had to sit down with a human being, get them to articulate to you how it was they performed whatever the task it was you were trying to automate. You had to write instructions based on that human explanation for machines to follow. But here's the problem with white collar work or head work. It often requires faculties like creativity or judgment or intuition, uh, which are very hard to articulate. Uh, and so it was thought very hard to automate. If a human being cannot explain how they perform a particular task, which so many head workers struggle to do, well, where do we begin in writing a set of instructions for a machine to follow? Uh, now, I think 30 years ago, this view of machine capabilities was right. Uh, that you had to somehow copy the thinking or the reasoning process of a human being. But today it's looking far more shaky. And I think in the future, it's just simply going to be wrong. Advances in processing power, data storage capability and algorithm design, particularly in machine learning, mean that it's no longer really necessary to copy human beings in certain domains in order to outperform them. So let me give you an example. Take the task of making a medical diagnosis. A system was recently developed at Stanford that can tell you whether or not a freckle is cancerous as accurately as leading dermatologists. 
Now, how does this system work? It's not trying to copy the judgment of a human doctor. Now, it knows, it understands nothing about medicine at all. Instead, it's got a database of about 130,000 past cases, uh, and it's running what's essentially a pattern recognition algorithm through those cases, you know, hunting for similarities between them uh, and the particular photo of the troubling lesion in question. You know, it's performing the task in an unhuman way, based on the analysis of more possible cases than any human doctor could hope to review in their lifetime. It doesn't matter, in short, that a human doctor cannot articulate uh, exactly how it is they exercise their judgment. That was a bottleneck on automation 40 years ago, but given the advances that have taken place, it's less and less a bottleneck. And for that reason, it seems to me that many more of the tasks and activities that we associate with head work uh, are increasingly uh, at risk of automation. I think the second reason for thinking that that rebalancing uh, that, that David described is, uh, is, um, is more likely is that not only is head less protected from automation, uh, but at the same time, I think it's very clear that hand and heart uh, work has proven to be very difficult to automate. Uh, now, the latter might be, you know, the, the latter might be unsurprising. It's relatively well known uh, that tasks that involve some kind of interpersonal interaction, some kind of empathetic response, nursing, caring, social work, and so on, that they are very hard to automate. Uh, but the fact that hand is also hard to automate, it seems to me, is, is less familiar. Um, in computer science, this is known as Moravec's paradox, that uh, many of the things we find, you know, in some sense, simplest to do with our hands are actually you know, the most difficult to automate. And conversely, some of the things we find easiest to do with our heads are the simplest. Uh, are some of the things we sort of find hardest to do, sorry, with our heads are the simplest to be, uh, to automate. So taking these two reasons for optimism together, or at least for thinking that this rebalancing uh, is likely, the, the fundamental point uh, is that the formal schooling required by a human being uh, to perform a particular task is less and less informative, it seems to me, as to whether or not that task can be automated. You know, head work is more at risk from automation than commonly supposed, and hand and heart work less so. So those are the two reasons that I think a rebalancing, given the technological changes that are taking place, is more likely. But I think there's also a, a reason for pessimism too, for thinking that automation might get in the way of that rebalancing uh, away from head and towards hand and heart. And, and the reason is this, which is that over the last few decades, as, as I've just said, head and hand workers, you know, they've tended, um, sorry, uh, hand and heart workers, you know, they've tended to find themselves protected from automation precisely because their roles very often involve person, personal interaction or manual dexterity. And these are the properties that, made it, that have made these, this type of work, um, heart work and hand work, so tricky to automate. But the, the cruel irony of the last few months is that these particular workers have in fact been hardest hit by the pandemic precisely because of these properties that protected them from automation. The virus spreads through and flourishes in the poorly ventilated indoor spaces, factories, plants, warehouses, where workers you know, tend to gather together to put their manual dexterity to use. And so as a result, as we've seen over the last eight to 12 months, in particular, many hand and heart workers have found themselves unable to work or at least unable to work safely. And so the point is this though, that if the pandemic has increased the incentive to automate the work that people do, and I think it may have, you know, after all, you know, just one reason, a machine cannot catch the virus and pass it on to coworkers or customers. It's not going to fall ill and need to, time, uh, to take time off work. It's not going to have to you know, self-isolate to protect its peers. At the margin, replacing a person with a machine uh, is more attractive than it might have been 12 months ago. So if we think there is a greater incentive at the moment to automate the work that people do, it's likely that it's going to be hand and heart workers who are the most exposed. You know, as we've seen, they cannot readily work in their traditional workplaces, nor can they uh, retreat to a, a home office and, and do their work from there instead. 
So those are just a few thoughts then um, on how the threat of automation might help uh, or indeed might hinder uh, our attempts to rebalance uh, head, hand and heart uh, in the way that David uh, set out just before. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. So, David, I don't want you to feel obliged to respond to everything that's been raised there because there are a lot of issues, but perhaps there might be one or two things that you think uh, you know, urgently need your response. <laughs> um, okay, quickly. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think in Daniel's case, he's, um, he's mainly um, sort of elaborating on some of the things I've said that there's perhaps, but I mean, right, there are a couple of points I would like to um, respond to in what Rachel was saying, um, partly because I do actually in the book raise um, one of the issues anyway that she was talking about. And I do, I'm, I make very, very much the point that if we are to raise the status of care in the public economy, the public care economy, we can't really do that without raising the status of care in the private realm, um, in the domestic realm. And I know, I mean, I, I actually talk about wages for housework, uh, that the wages for housework movement in the book, and, and what a shame it was that they failed. <laughs> um, you know, feminism has, be has been dominated by kind of a sort of professional woman feminism that has in some ways become an obstacle to raising the status of, of domesticity. Um, now, obviously, um, you know, we should talk about spreading the, the, the domestic labor more evenly between men and women. And that is happening, um, I mean, somewhat slowly, um, um, you know, and that raises questions about how, um, you know, sort of fundamental differences between men and women. Are men and women essentially not only equal, but the same, or are there important differences in, uh, uh, the, in preferences between men and women that, will, that are likely to be with us for, for many, 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 uh, hundreds of years to come, if not forever. Um, I mean, that's perhaps not an issue we want to go into today. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, raising the status of domesticity is absolutely um, essential to to this new world. And I think um, that you know, the, the modern feminism needs to become more pluralistic. To, it, it shouldn't just be representing the interests of women who place um, career first. I mean, the, you know, the, um, I mean, the, 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 the famous schema um, produced by Catherine Hakim that said, um, if you look at adult women in Britain, about 20% are um, you know, mainly or exclusively career focused, about 20% are mainly or exclusively family focused, and, and the 60% in the middle are kind of balancing both uh, in, the, in the modern world. Um, but still, you know, you, you know, if you look at if you look at surveys, m most women with children would prefer to spend more time at home if they could afford it um, when children are very young, um, and that is um, that is kind of not not really recognised in in family policy, which has been dominated by a kind of uh, professional woman feminism, which I think is a, is a serious obstacle, as I say, to raising the status of domesticity. Um, I mean, the, the other point about, um, you know, is, is it economics or is it culture, essentially? Um, uh, um, uh, is, it is it redistribution or is it recognition? I mean, of course, it's both. I mean, I mean, I guess I'm slightly bending the stick against the assumptions, you know, most social science um, is dominated by the left and the left is, is kind of um, a little bit wary about sort of cultural and psychological um, factors in determining discontent is it's far happier with the kind of with the simplicity of economic inequality you know that's kind of where it feels comfortable um, but I think it's missing uh, you know a very large part of the story and and actually you know if you look at you know it's very it's not easy to correlate political discontent with uh, income inequality I mean income inequality has actually not been rising particularly sharply in recent years wealth inequality may have been it's true but uh, partly because of QE and so on um, but income inequality has not been rising and you know and if income inequality is the thing that drives these kinds of discontents why is it that Scandinavia you know is is you know has such uh, strong populist movements um, despite being the most equal place on the planet um, yeah let me leave it there
Rachel, do you want to make a quick response to any of that before we get on to questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, so I'll say a couple of things. So, I mean, I do think that it's interesting, the question of wages for housework, right? Because wages for the wages for housework movement was precisely a call for redistribution rather than recognition. You know, Sil Silvia Federici was not primarily interested in having her work be higher prestige. Rather, she was interested in being paid for her labor. I mean, the reason she wanted to be paid for her labor was that she thought that uh, the capitalist economic system would not be able to be maintained if there were an expectation that unwaged work become paid. So you might disagree with that. But I do think, you know, it's possible to reconfigure the demands of the wages for housework movement using a kind of recognitional vernacular. But it, it, it is, I think, important to note that that is a sort of significant, one is uh, engaged in significant sort of normative and political translation at that point. And, you know, I'm a philosopher rather than a social scientist. So my primary aim is not in understanding why, in fact, people articulate discontent, but in what is just or not. So I take the point, these are sort of interesting questions for social scientists, but I'm not a social scientist. And what I'm interested in is really whether there is some sort of foundational species of justice. And if so, whether that is primarily recognitional or redistributive. I would also contest the um, characterization of the left as primarily concerned with redistribution. I think that might've been true 20 years ago, but I think it's mm. highly inaccurate as a characterization of the contemporary left, both in Britain and America, where I think the dominant political vernacular is that of recognition rather than redistribution. Yeah, arguably it's swapped around actually. So let's go to some of these questions. So there's a question from Pre Professor Kevin Le Grandeur who asks, what do you think of universal basic income as at least a partial solution to technological unemployment caused by AI? Daniel, I know that you've uh, defended what you call um, CBI, conditional basic income. Yeah. Do you want to have a go at this question? Yes, uh, I mean, my, my concern with yeah, what's appealing about a universal basic income is that it, it solves what I call the distribution problem, which is, you know, in a world where we can't necessarily rely upon the labor market to share out prosperity in society, how do we do it? Well, a universal basic income does it. It provides an income to everyone independent of their, of their status in the labor market. What worries me, though, about a universal basic income is that while it solves that distribution problem, it neglects what I call the contribution problem, which is a feeling that everybody is you know, paying into the collective pot in some way. Now, I'm an economist and, you know, my sense of, you know, of social solidarity today is that it comes in large part through a feeling that everybody is pulling their economic weight through the work that they're doing and the taxes that they pay. And if they're not in work, there's an expectation if they're able to work to actively, you know, retrain and seek out work. And so, you know, the, the challenge for me uh, of a universal basic income um, is you know, what do you do in a world where some people are not paying into the collective pot through the sorts of economic contributions that they, you know, traditionally might have made? How do you maintain social society in that world? And the argument that I make in, in my work is that, well, we need to look at the sort of non-economic contributions that people, uh, that people make to, to society. And, and, you know, we've heard lots of examples of this in the past 45 minutes. They're all around us. They're not recognized in the labor market in the form of a wage. Might we as a society be able to hold them up and say, look, these are valuable and important. They're socially significant and, um, and they're, you know, they are contributions. Uh, and might those sorts of things be done in return for a basic income instead. So my, my concern with the basic income is less the base, the B and the I and more the U. And I think we need some kind of conditionality, even if that conditionality isn't the sort of economic condition, uh, conditionality that we might have uh, relied upon in the past. You say this as an economist, but John Rawls, for example, and his understanding of uh, free and equal citizens, an essential yeah. part of that is that you're prepared to cooperate on fair terms with others provided they're willing to do so as well. And inherent for him in that cooperation was actually engaging in productive work. 
So mm -hmm. in a sense, almost like Marx, his theory is primarily addressed to people who are prepared to work and willing to work. And then he addresses others as a kind of exceptional case. So it's, there is this issue of contribution yeah. as being inherent to citizen dignity. And now the question I think that your proposal powerfully raises is, does that notion of contribution have to be channeled through something like work or could there be surrogates for that? Yeah. Are any other thoughts on this issue? David, could, could I? It's not. I mean, it's not something I've thought about a huge amount. But I mean, it does strike me that most of the people that who propose it tend to be the affluent and the cognitively blessed, who assume that everybody is as sort of self-starting and self-motivated as they are. I think work acts as an absolutely fundamental source of meaning and purpose for many people. It's the source of their social lives, their friendships, their all sorts of things, and uh, and. You know, the cognitively blessed and affluent sort of imagine sitting around at home learning the piano or reading Plato. And uh, not everybody is like that. Um, perhaps only a minority of people are like that. My second objection is that UBI would require a really serious policing of citizenship. Uh, that it would make the hostile environment seem like child's play. And we would need a far, far more hostile environment for um, for UBI to work. I mean, citizenship would have to be really seriously policed. David, I'm a bit surprised at your first comment because I tweeted something from your book which said that um, we really need to reorient our education system in such a way that people get a serious training in the arts, in skills and so forth, so that they are better placed to make use of their leisure. Now, could it be the case that if we think of these things in a more holistic way, that we can think about a contribution that's not work related because people will have been trained up properly in school to make good use of their time. That, that is possible, but I, th but I think it's a bit utopian. <laughs> I mean- uh, Well, it was your thought, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it, it was interesting what you said, David, though, about the cognitively blessed. I mean, that was the way in which the kind of cognitive blessing ran for you. I mean, for me, my fear is that it's the, it's the people, it's the cognitively blessed uh, who are thinking that the only source of meaning and purpose in life is through work uh, because they happen to get it through the work that they do. Um, and, you know, if you actually look at, uh, and this is something I, I write about, you know, if you actually look at polling of do you get meaning and purpose from, and this is a sort of David Graeber point again, do you actually get meaning and purpose from the work that you do? A really extraordinary proportion of people, particularly in vast, advanced economies, do not. Now, one reaction to that is, okay, well, we need to make work more meaningful, more purposeful. But there's another, which is that, Perhaps there are other types of you know, other types of activity. Yeah, you're quite uh, right. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I I do agree with that, and I and I quote the figures, um, and I and I kind of, you know, I can't help kind of rather admiring the fact that about half of the population uh, who who are surveyed in the U.S. and the U.K. say that um, work they they go to work merely to earn money. Um, that. Yeah, the, the, the kind of notion, as you say, the kind of cognitively blessed who tend to see work as a form of self-realization and all of that doesn't apply um, to large parts of the population. Um, but, I, but I think, um, I mean, so you're right to pick me up on that. And, I, and what I'm saying is slightly contra internally contradictory, but I still maintain that, you know, a, a lot of those people are saying, you know, I essentially go to work to, to earn money um, do also get, um, if not self-realization, they get, um, they do get kind of meaning and purpose and, and friendship and, and association in ways that, um, look, you know, people have been driven crazy by sitting at home for the last year. I mean, you know, I mean, do we really want, you know, I mean, that, that is what UBI is offering us forever. Well, hopefully though, at some point we can exit our homes. Um, Rachel, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I wanted to make two points. So, I mean, what one point would be something like, it may well be true, conditional upon the sort of institutional and social structures that we in fact have, that people without work find meaning extremely inaccessible. But if you use that as an argument against UBI, there's something kind of illicit about that because presumably implementing UBI would have a relatively significant effect on what the sort of basic social institute, you know, basic social institutions are. So if that is something like in a society with UBI, the sort of basic structure of society would presumably be altered in such a way as to provide paths to meaning and purpose that are not currently present. 
So it, it does seem sort of slightly like a non secretary to me to argue um, by thinking about what sort of the phenomenological character of worklessness under contemporary economic conditions looks like and using that as an argument against UBI. I also wanted to say that I do think that there are difficulties for anyone who is purportedly committed to some principle along the lines of liberal neutrality in wanting to defend a conditional basic income because, you know, this notion of production and productive labor, it's highly value laden, right? I mean, one of the primary things that people associated with the Wages for Housework movement wanted to do, so here Federici isn't so much involved, but people like Solo James and Maria Della Costa, one of the things they're interested in is they're interested in arguing for the idea that housework is productive labor, which it was not counted as in the traditional Marxian schema. So I mean, I have real worries about any kind of implementation of a conditional basic income that says, sure, sure, you can have some money so long as you're being productive, that doesn't recognize that the notion of productiveness is heavily ideologically inflected and has functioned historically to completely erase the work of women. And I just have serious reservations about the capacity to implement some kind of conditional test that doesn't sort of smuggle in some sort of conception of the good life in a way that, you know, people who are actually committed to liberal neutrality should be extremely wary about. Now, this is fascinating, Rachel, mm. because I think you're now at odds with both of the other speakers. So in, in Daniel's case, I think he rejects the requirement of liberal neutrality. In fact, towards the end of his book, he has the phrase big state, capital B, capital S, as having a new role in, I think you say, creating meaning. And one of the ways it creates meaning is to address precisely the issue we talked about before, what will count as a meaningful contribution by you in, in society if it's not going to be through regular work. So I think it looks like Daniel's not buying your premise. And I suspect, um, David, you're not buying it either because some of the policy proposals you're coming up with do look like they're sort of framed by the idea that it's the job of the state to help us lead more fulfilling lives. Therefore, it has to make judgments about what counts as more, ful more fulfilling than not. I mean, I would just say that I was only defending a conditional claim. I wasn't defending the antecedent of the conditional. Okay. But do you, either of you want to, because there is an issue about you're both defending positions that seem to call for a very activist state that abandons notions of liberal neutrality, i.e. the state not passing judgment on what yeah. counts as a worthwhile life. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's exactly, that's a, that's a nice way of capturing my argument. You know, at the moment, you know, what value is uh, allocated according to wages in the market. And if that is no longer, you know, if, if the market is no longer the mechanism through which we allocate, you know, value, um, how else are we to do it? Um, and it seems to me that's, you know, that's a sort of a fascinating, exciting, and and you know troubling, uh, tr you know, troubling challenge. But I think it's you know if you think we are moving into a world where there might be less work for people to do because of the sorts of technological changes we're describing, I, I can't see how we how we avoid the the state sort of stepping away from that neutrality. And so part of the answer might be it has to be a much more democratic state if it's going to take on that role. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and I do use capital B and capital S, but I'm quite clear that I have a very different conception of the big state in my mind to you know, the, the big state of the 20th century. Okay. David, do you want to come in on this? Not really, or rather. Okay. Um, I mean, there other I think, you know, since the death of God, I mean, you know, you know meaning, um, meaning has been a real problem um, in human societies, the creation of meaning. I mean, I, I really... I find slightly frightening the idea that the state is taking over the role of meaning creation. I mean, you know, uh, we are we are kind of meaning seeking beings, I think, and we we do sort of create it uh, off our own bats in a way. Um, it's just that a, a lot of people don't have enough of it in their lives, um, and um, I'm not. I, yeah, I mean, or I think one 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 can distinguish between meaning and recognition. I mean, you know, we're, we're all recognition seeking and meaning creating beings. Um, and, and indeed, you know, this is one of the reasons why I kind of wrote the book is that too much meaning and recognition has clustered around a certain set of human functions and 
And I think if we do, you know, and if we, if we do succeed, I mean, th these things are not in the gift of politics or not completely in the gift of politics. Politics can only nudge these things along, I think. Um, but I think, you know, spreading um, meaning and recognition away from just the cognitive uh, or, or the, the over, um, the over um, allocation of, the, of it to the cognitive um, world is, is part of the answer anyway. Can I raise a question from Anirudh Suresh, who asks, how poised are different countries stroke forms of governance to deal with the challenges posed to work and life by automation? Anyone like to take that one up? Well, I mean, my, my general view is that, you know, I mean, and one of the reasons I wrote the book that I wrote is that I don't think we're taking seriously enough the threat of a world where there's not enough well-paid work for everyone to do. Not necessarily because, you know, there aren't enough jobs for people to do full stop, but for various reasons, people might, at least for the next decade or so, people might not be able to do the sort of work that has to be done. Uh, that's out there to be done, uh, and and I and yeah, you know, and that's not simply an issue that people don't have the right skills. It's it's far more complex than that. Uh, and yeah, my, my view is that we're not taking seriously enough that threat. I think. I mean, one. I mean, it's interesting to compare. I guess you know more individualistic Western liberal democracies, and um, you know East Asian. Or you know, Asian societies, which tend to be more disciplined, more communitarian, less individualistic, where where meaning is sort of meaning is sort of provided, if not by the state, by more rigid social uh, rules and conventions of a kind that you know we you know we spent the last hundred and fifty years sort of shrugging off. Um, I think they they continue to exist in some ways, even without God. <laughs> um, and it may be that those those societies will find it easier to uh, people will be driven less mad by having nothing to do because the, because society will allocate them things to do. David, can I raise a question about meritocracy? Since you raised that towards the end of your talk, and it's in the book, and so. Th consider three kinds of um, objections you could have to meritocracy. And I, I think there are two, at least two of them are in your book. So one is that meritocracy, meritocracy is fine in, in theory, but in practice, the game is rigged, that people don't really get to compete on fair terms, that um, well-off individuals are able to create special advantages for their children. And so we may laud meritocracy in theory, it doesn't exist in practice. That's one kind of argument, which I do think is present in your book. Another kind of argument says meritocracy is fine, but you must have a sufficiently expansive understanding of merit and you must take on board a broader range of achievements. So those achievements are not going to be purely cognitive, intellectual, there'll be other sorts as well, and they're going wrong in being too narrow. But there's another criticism, which I think is in your book, but I'd like to be clear, and that is that but merit isn't everything, achievement isn't everything. And people do have worth in a democratic society as fellow citizens who count and are deserving of a certain kind of respect. And one of the ways to see this is that, you know, one of the ways in which, one of the many ways in which the Chinese system of social credit will make you uneasy is the thought that it's making certain entitlements like ability to travel depend on whether you've been a good boy or girl. And we think people have rights that are in some sense independent of their performance. And so merit can't be everything. Um, so I'm just wondering which of these you're focusing on, because often it seemed to be you were focusing yeah. on that second point saying, yeah, meritocracy is great, but just expand the range. Yeah, of you, you, you put that rather well, a, a kind of more expansive idea of, of merit um, that would include a much broader range, you know, would include you know, domestic work um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, important but boring work, you know, like stacking shelves in a supermarket. I mean, you know, um, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, as you say, uh, I mean, in free societies that allow parents to hand on their advantages to their children, um, 
meritocracy will always be very limited and flawed, which is not to say that we shouldn't still, you know, worry about, you know, raising the educational floor where, where you know, as far as possible, so that, um, so that people can more equally compete. Um, but yeah, I mean, meritocracy is, is um, um, you know, is, is not an ideal, um, but um, it's, it's, and it's, I mean, the really fundamental, was it Nietzsche who talked about, um, I mean, you know, I suppose he was writing right at the beginning of the kind of modern democratic age in a way, and that but one of the really sort of unavoidable and perpetual tensions in our societies is that we have, I mean, on the one hand, now very expansive ideas of equality, um, you know, they're, they're not just not just theoretical. I mean, you know, since um, you know, political and legal equality, okay, is, is quite quite old. Um, um, well, not that old actually. Um, um, they, but you know, the idea of you know everybody having a vote is still only what about a hundred years old in, in most of our societies. Um, the idea of the moral equality of all human beings is a remarkably recent idea. I mean, it was a, it was kind of, you know, the 1948 UN Charter of Human Rights is really where it was first sort of laid down. Um, but, you know, these things have been absorbed now into our societies. I think the, the, the idea of equality, of kind of political, legal, democratic, moral equality, um, um, you know, and indeed pushing it further is what, you know, you were implying this is what kind of modern identity politics of the left is partly about pushing these things even further. Um, and yet, you know, the idea of, of equality runs up unavoidably against the, the maldistribution of talent, you know, and, and, and aptitudes and abilities in societies, you know, and if we want our societies to, to function at all efficiently, then we have to reward talent, people who have the, the, the abilities and the talents that, that allow us to, to, you know, to be rich, to live in rich societies. Um, but I was wondering uh, whether you thought nonetheless there was a plateau of equal status that is independent of achievement. That has no, to be- I mean, you know, that's what, you know, that's what all the, the kind of equality side of the equation is all about. You know, well, you know it's that, that is what democratic equality is all about, is seeing each other as, as equal, you know, whether you're, whether you've got an IQ of 150 or 80, uh, or, you know, whether you're, you know, whatever your, whatever your talents are, but we also need, I mean, you know, we also can't escape the fact that the yeah. talents are very unevenly distributed, um, and always will be, and, and we need to reward talent in order for the place to work, you know, we have, you know, we have hierarchies of competence and ability and everything, um, and you know we can't just throw those out the window. Um, so this is a permanent tension. I mean, Nietzsche saw it as as the source of resentment. You know, he used the you know, resentiment. I think he talked about, it, didn't he? So he used a kind of French word, I think. Um, and you know, and it may be that modern populism is part of partly an expression of, the, of kind of Nietzschean resentiment. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I think you know, partly legitimately so. You know, if, if you know people are taking equality seriously, and then they, if they find that they're, you know, in, in the kind of bottom part of the social spectrum, um, I mean, I, you know, I mean, either because uh, life is unfair, um, and you know, the affluent have found ways of handing on their privilege to their children, or just because, or, you know, even if we sort that problem out, I suppose is what I'm saying. Actually, even in a perfect world in which we've sorted out all of that. Um, there will be, there will not be an even distribution of talent. And so there will always be a source of resentment. Rachel, do you want to come in on this? I mean, I do think there is an interesting question lurking in the background here about the justification for meritocracy. So, I mean, you might be a kind of rollsy in about things, right? And you might think that, look, the idea is just something like, if everybody is gonna live an okay life, then we need to have certain kinds of institutionalized patterns of reward. People develop legitimate expectations about what kinds of 
practices and skills they're going to be rewarded for, but there are no sort of just facts out there about which kinds of skills and abilities are worthwhile and which we ought to reward. Um, but you might think, well, that's not really capturing the really important intuition behind meritocracy, which is just, look, some things are more worthwhile than others. You might be a theorist who thinks that notions of desert should figure in uh, redistributive justice, right? We definitely think that desert matters in the criminal justice system, right? Like, it's very difficult to justify practices of incarceration if you don't think that desert is a significant driver in cases of retributive justice. But once you allow that the state is allowed to be sensitive to considerations of desert, and once you abandon liberal equality, it's really not clear to me that the best justification of meritocracy available to you isn't simply to be some kind of perfectionist, just to say, look, the reason I'm paying you more money than you isn't because that's part of some kind of overall efficient pattern of resource distribution, which ultimately is going to make everybody better off. But just because, you know, your novel is better than your operata or because your sort of surgery is more important for human flourishing than your poem. And yeah, so I, I think there, there are definitely, once you've abandoned liberal equality, it's really very unclear to me that justifications of meritocracy, if, if one is in the business of providing justifications for meritocracy, can appeal to sort of just far more kind of robust notions of, um, desert than the kinds of justifications, David, that you were sketching a minute ago seem to seem to be in the business of. You're saying that David's trying to have it both ways, but he can't. He can't have his liberal equality and an emphasis on grading people in terms of achievement. No, I, I was more trying to suggest that um, I think when people are defending meritocracy, there's this kind of tendency for people to want to justify meritocracy, if they are in the business of defending meritocracy, to try to do so in a way that's kind of compatible yeah. with liberal equality. And it's just not clear to me that, you know, if, if you're not committed to liberal equality as, you know, it's, if you're not committed to uh, liberal neutrality, I was just trying to make the point that you suddenly this kind of vista of alternative ways to justify uh, uh, to justify meritocracy are, are available to you. You can simply appeal to considerations of desert. And I was trying to make the point that you might think actually one of the ways in which we can put pressure on liberal neutrality is by pointing to the way in which there are already embedded in most liberal states, there's some kind of appeal to considerations of desert. We do appeal to those when we're thinking about uh, retributive justice already. I mean, I, I think we forget, how, I mean, Michael Young, I mean, my, you know, my book is seen as, uh, you know, is sometimes coupled with, it was reviewed with the Michael Sandel book, it's seen as a book that's critical of meritocracy, as indeed it is to some extent, but more, as you were suggesting, John, because, um, because of the cognitive prefix, that we need a more expansive idea of, of, of human merit, because we will always require um, hierarchies of competence, you know, even Michael Young himself, Acknowledge that um, you know that we need to, to have meritocratic selection for jobs, for top jobs. As I said, um, I mean we forget that you know Michael Young was a radical egalitarian. I mean he was an un utterly idealistic socialist um, who thought that the idea of equality of opportunity was deeply conservative. I mean as in some ways it is. Um, you know meritocracy is unavoidably elitist, and it's uh, and it's. And it's unavoidably um, inegalitarian. The whole point of, of um, equality of opportunity is the opportunity to be unequal. Um, I mean, you know, uh, the ideal obviously is that that inequality starts from a level playing field, but that is never going to happen as we were just saying, um, which, which doesn't mean to say that one shouldn't strive towards it. There are lots of things that are unattainable, but are still worth kind of attempting to, to get to. But, um, you know, as, you know, it, as some American philosophers said, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, you know, I think the person in the street would think it's common sense in a way that, that the most able people um, should, should run most things in our societies. Um, 
but you know you wait until the children of the most able people are still <laughs> running everything in our society and then the children's children of the most able people i mean you know, meritocracy does have this tendency to turn into to kind of oligarchy um so it's not a you know it's not a it's never going to be a kind of we're never going to reach it it's not going to be a and it's and it's not even really an ideal is it i mean the most able winning and everyone else losing is not um an idea that that, that appeals Okay, I think with those comments, we will have to reach an end. So thank you so much, David. That was a really excellent discussion, as you saw shown by the fact that we went way over time. Um, thank you very much to the two commentators, Rachel Fraser and Daniel Suskind, and to everyone for tuning in. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye.